Summit got off to a bumpy start as he didn't receive the red carpet treatment usually offered to world leaders. Was it a carefully calculated snub or a simple mishap on the behalf of the Chinese? As President Obama arrived in the eastern Chinese city of Hangzhou on Saturday, no rolling staircase had been prepared for his exit from Air Force One. Instead, he had to make his way out from a little-used exit. There are also altercations between US and Chinese officials as Obama got off the plane and US reporters were told to move. A Chinese official was heard shouting, this is our country, this is our airport. President Obama later downplayed the situation. It can cause some friction. Uh, it's not the first time it's happened. Uh, it doesn't just happen in China, it happens in other countries where uh, we travel. Chinese authorities laid out the red carpet for other world leaders, such as South Korean President Park Geun-hye, British Prime Minister Theresa May and Russian President Vladimir Putin. This sparked speculation that the lukewarm reception was a calculated move on Beijing's part, reflecting tensions between the two superpowers. Obama later met with Chinese President Xi Jinping for four hours on the sidelines of the G20 summit. Officials say they discuss sensitive topics such as the territorial disputes in the South China Sea and the upcoming deployment of the THAAD missile defence system to South Korea. Both sides didn't back down from their positions on the issues. China's President Xi Jinping has met with his uh, Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin at the G20 summit in Hangzhou. President Xi urged China and Russia to push forward the alignment of their development strategies and to dovetail the Belt and Road Initiative with the Eurasian Economic Union. And she said the two countries should cooperate more closely on international and regional issues. He also called for stronger military and security cooperation. And Putin said Russia should join hands with China to ensure that the political trust and friendship between the nations can provide a boost in economic cooperation. Я уже вам говорил, что предприниматели китайские сказали, что вас очень любят мороженое. Я обещал вам привезти. Вот я уже сказал вам, подарок вам привез целую коробку мороженого. And the World Bank today, for the first time, issued a bond denominated in special drawing rights in China. The debt was issued in China's interbank bond market and marks an additional step in the internationalization of the Chinese currency. The RMB is to join the World Bank's SDR basket of currencies in October. The World Bank has set an indicated yield range for the three-year bonds at between 0.4 and 0.7 percent annually. The value of the SDR notes is based on a basket of international currencies, the US dollar, the euro, the British pound, and the Japanese yen. The Chinese RMB will be included from this October and will then help determine the value of the bonds. The bond purchases will be settled in yuan. This is the first SDR bond issued anywhere in 35 years. China's central bank has approved the World Bank's issue of a total of 2 billion worth of SDR bonds in China. If the first float goes well, other issues will follow. Uh, what we expect is that such issuance will become more common. Uh, so, so when you look at that event last year, at that moment we say, oh, this is just the beginning. Uh, are there going to be real uh, material changes on the road? Well, this, these, uh, these are material changes. The bond is named the Mulan bond after the famous Disney character. The World Bank says the RMB will have a 10.92% weighting in the SDR basket, greater than the proportion granted to the British pound or the Japanese yen. The U.S. is not rushing into a deal with Russia to try to end Syria's long and brutal civil war. Officials from both sides spent the weekend trying to reach an agreement. U.S. officials thought they'd be announcing a groundbreaking deal with Russia to coordinate airstrikes against ISIS and al-Qaeda-linked terrorists in Syria. But there was a hitch. There still remain, as I say, a couple of tough issues. Russia had pulled back from their initial agreement with the U.S. So John Kerry and, and uh, his counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, had been working uh, 
around the clock, as well as a number of other negotiators, to see what would a real cessation of these look like that could provide that humanitarian access and provide uh, people uh, in places like Aleppo relief. We're not there yet. Uh, and you know, understandably, given the previous failures of cessations of hostilities to hold, um, you know, we uh, approach it with some skepticism. But it is worth trying. Russia's President Vladimir Putin says that the conflict in Syria can only be resolved through political means. Putin made the remark in a meeting with a group of world leaders on the sidelines of the G20 summit in eastern China. He added that terrorism could be successfully tackled if uh, countries with vested interests come together for joint efforts. Putin's comments come as uh, Russia and the U.S. are discussing the situation in Syria on the sidelines of the G20 summit. Earlier on Saturday, the U.S. State Department said a deal on Syria was very close, but U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry later dismissed the news. Kerry added that there are tough issues that need to be worked out before Washington and Moscow agree on a deal for Syria. As the U.S. and Russia struggle to reach a ceasefire deal in Syria, fighting rages on. In Aleppo, Syrian government forces and their allies laid siege to rebel-held areas in the east of the city. The offensive relied heavily on Russian air power and reversed key gains by the rebels in early August. In northeastern Syria, Turkey and its allies opened a new line of attack. Turkish tanks rolled across the border, and Syrian fighters swept in from the west to take villages held by Islamic State. Together, they appear to have driven the hardline group from all the areas along the Turkish border. Footage is said to show rebels with the Nur ad-Din Zinki Brigade moving through villages east of Errai and raising their flag. The offensive continues a full-scale Turkish incursion that began 10 days ago. Turkey is also trying to stop the advance of the U.S.-backed Kurdish YPG militia. Ankara fears that their advance would embolden Kurdish militants inside of Turkey. And security forces have continued extending a concrete security barrier on the country's border with Syria. The state-run Anadolu news agency reported earlier that the new stretch of war would be built between two Turkish border towns. The move is to enhance security and prevent cross-border incursions by Kurdish militia. Turkey views the Kurds as a threat, with Turkey-backed forces clashing with Kurdish militia outside the Syrian city of Jarablus, just across the border from the Turkish town Kakamis. We will build a great wall along the southern border. 2016 presidential election has ignited a debate about security on the United States' southern border with Mexico. But the border between Canada and America is also attracting scrutiny. The U.S. has steadily been beefing up surveillance on the northern border with new technology designed to help monitor areas too remote for round-the-clock patrols by field agents. Much of the change comes from the gradual rollout of new technologies that were promised in the aftermath of a security reassessment following the 2001 terrorist attacks. About 300,000 people a day legally crossed the U.S.-Canada border, the largest bilateral flow of people in the world. We have far less problem with that border than we do with our southern border. And but some legislators in northern border states worry about the possibility of terrorist infiltration due to the number of refugees Canada has taken in. The Canadian government has resettled more than 25,000 Syrians since November of 2015. Currently, 3,700 officers are stationed in 117 authorized land border crossings between the U.S. and Canada. Around 2,200 agents are assigned to patrol the northern border in shifts, a 500% increase since September 11, 2001. But that still leaves only one officer every two miles if deployed simultaneously. The European Council has been begging for the world's help during the refugee crisis. Those who criticize us should rather think how to increase their assistance because what Europe provides is already massive. But now the Council's president is saying countries in the region are close to the limits. Only global efforts supporting refugees and the host communities will be able to bear fruit. Those efforts include demands for more money and more resettlement cooperation in United Nations countries, with a specific call out to the U.S. 
Keep in mind that the U.S. has contributed the most financially to the United Nations refugee efforts every year since 2009, almost five times as much as the next highest donor. The country has been criticized, however, for how few Syrian refugees it has taken in compared to other Western countries. Yet the acceptance of Syrian refugees has sparked a political debate in several European countries. This is a very deep crisis. This is a crisis that is about real interest, but it's also about identity and it's about important political principles. But in a world where 24 people are displaced every minute, it's unclear where they will go if Europe will no longer accept them. We'll start this hour with breaking news because exit polls suggest that there is embarrassment for Angela Merkel tonight after her party was beaten into third place by the Social Democrats and the right-wing alternative for Germany party in regional elections in her home state. The vote's being seen as a key popularity test of the Chancellor's policies. It's a stunning defeat for German Chancellor Angela Merkel in her home district. The anti-immigrant alternative for Germany party, or AFD, taking second place with 21% of the vote over her conservative Christian Democrats 19%, according to exit polls. <laughs> AFD's main candidate, Life Eric Holm of Mecklenburg for Pommern, hailed the results. Maybe today is the beginning of the end of the chancellorship of Angela Merkel. <laughs> The center-left Social Democrats won 30.5 percent, but lost ground from the last election. The AFD had campaigned hard against the Chancellor's open-door refugee policy. <laughs> Polls now show the party making gains nationwide, one year ahead of federal elections. Port and with the G20 summit underway in China, North Korea lobbed not one, not two, but three ballistic missiles into the East Sea earlier today. The Joint Chiefs of Staff said the missiles are believed to be a medium-range Anodon-class missiles. They flew about 1,000 kilometers, coming down in waters within Japan's air defense identification zone. And the missiles were launched without issuing a no-sale warning. South Korea's military authorities say they've been keeping a close watch on possible provocations as September 9th, this coming Friday, the 68th anniversary of North Korea's founding. Uh, now, North Korea has a track record of provocations around this important date for the regime. Uh, two years ago, Pyongyang test fired two short range ballistic missiles to mark the national holiday. And we must also remember that these launches come less than two weeks after the North test fired a submarine launched ballistic missile. And now, Israel has targeted Syria's Golan Heights with an airstrike. Tel Aviv says that it hit cannons of the Syrian army, and the raid was in response to a mortar attack from Syria. Israeli forces also launched a similar attack in the same area just last month in reaction to what they called stray fire from the Syrian side. Israel conducted both attacks from part of the Golan Heights, which is under its occupation. Tel Aviv captured the area back in 1967 and has defied international calls to return the land since then. Well, for the second time in a week, a scary situation at LAX. This morning, Terminal 3 was evacuated after police arrested three auto theft suspects. A security breach at LAX Sunday morning. At about 9 a.m., airport police patrolling Terminal 3 came across a stolen vehicle. During the arrest procedure, officers asked the people on the sidewalk to move inside the terminal area, but some travelers panicked. There were some uh, people that were concerned for their safety, and they actually moved quickly through the TSA screening areas without being screened. Uh, so as a result of that, uh, there were people that were in our, our sterile areas, and there were even a small number of people that uh, found their way out into the airfield. Everyone was quickly brought back into the public area, but out of an abundance of caution, the entire terminal was evacuated. Officers and explosive detection canine units then performed a security recheck. We decided to rescreen everyone that was in Terminal 3, and so we did that uh, with the help and support of TSA uh, quickly, and everything uh, came back to uh, kind of normalcy uh, within a brief period of time. During those two hours of chaos, all Terminal 3 airlines were impacted. That includes Frontier, JetBlue, Spirit, and Virgin America. 18 incoming and outgoing flights were delayed, with arriving passengers held on the airplanes. The U.S. state of North Dakota, a protest by Native Americans there turns violent after demonstrators criticized the construction of a pipeline on a field they consider sacred land.
Well, they they tried to try to push us back with their their trucks and their bulldozers, but we just kept on coming and and uh, we just pushed them all the way back over the hill. Now officials say that four security guards were injured, one taken to nearby a hospital with undisclosed injuries. Meanwhile, Native American elders say that at least 30 protesters were pepper sprayed. The demonstrators say construction crews have destroyed burial and cultural sites there. The, uh, they're also worried about the possible contamination of a nearby river by the project. A federal judge will rule before September 9th whether construction can be halted on the Dakota Access Pipeline. Scientists in Singapore have found that the Zika virus behind the outbreak in the city-state probably did not come from Brazil, but from a local strain already in Southeast Asia. Singapore's Ministry of Health says researchers sequenced the DNA of the Zika virus found in two local patients, and the results showed it likely evolved from a strain that's been in the region for decades. Experts welcomed the news as it could mean most locals are immune from the strain, What's more, the genetic distance from the Brazilian version would dramatically lower the risk of brain defects in infants believed to be caused by the virus. Pope Francis officially canonized Mother Teresa on Sunday in an elaborate ceremony in St. Peter's Square. More than 100,000 people from all over the world attended the canonization ceremony. In Kolkata, India, where Mother Teresa lived and worked, hundreds of people gathered at the headquarters of the Missionaries of Charity, the congregation she founded in 1950, to offer prayers and watch the live broadcast from the Vatican. I feel she's there. She's present there. Maya Sadhwani, like many Indians here in Kolkata, worships Mother Teresa alongside Hindu deities. For me, she is a saint. She's a god for me. There was a light behind her. The Albanian nun becomes a Catholic saint after nearly 20 years of confirming miracles and paperwork. But many in her adopted home adopted her as a goddess years ago. Sunita Kumar, a retired designer and volunteer for the Missionaries of Charity, prays every morning to Mother Teresa after she recites a Sikh and Hindu prayer. Mary, Mother of Jesus, be a mother to me now and please uh, help in doing uh, what I want you to do. Many in Kolkata believe Mother Teresa protects them from above. <laughs> 